Hello everybody. Today we continue our introduction to recursive formulations for algorithm design. We have already done two lessons earlier. We move to the third one now. We have seen that our process of algorithm design by recursion transformation goes through a phase of initial solutions and from these initial solutions we so we go through a phase of initial solutions which is a recursive definition with an inductive proof of correctness analysis of the recursive recurring solutions then we unfold the recursion tree and examine the structures from this we determine various kinds of choice points and complexity analysis and then as we proceed we identify the data structure that may be required to remember past computation for future use and then go on to develop the final algorithm. Today we shall move on with another very unique example case where the recursion itself is available upfront as a definition, but the evaluation of that recursion efficiently forms an important aspect of how we solve such recurrence or recursive definitions and will yield to a unique concept which is very fundamental in algorithm design. In order to do that we will take a very traditional old example that all of us know, but maybe there is something about that example that all of us do not know. So, coming to the history of such recursive definitions the 3rd century BC had Pingala who was a mathematician who based on his <coughs> knowledge of music in his work a very seminal work called Chanda Shastra which means the, the scripture of rhythms presents the first known description of binary numeral system in connection with the systematic enumeration of meters of fixed patterns of long and short syllables. The discussion of the combinatorics of this meter of how long and short syllables combine forms what he had said was something which eventually became what is called the binomial theorem. And a commentary on his work which was called the Meru Prasthara is actually what we see and what we know as the Pascal's triangle, but this was done in the 3rd century BC. Pingala's work also contains a very interesting phenomenon which talks about the number of ways in which you can form musical notes of length n using long and short symbols. If the statement says that the number of ways in which you can form a musical note of length l of length n is the number of ways in which you can form a musical notes of length n minus 1 followed by a short symbol plus the number of ways in which you can form musical notes of length n minus 2 followed by a long symbol. A short symbol is of length 1 and a long symbol is of length 2. And we know that such a thing which defines that the number of ways in which you can form this symbol is the number of ways in which you can form n minus 1 followed by a short symbol plus the number of ways in which you can form n minus 2 length uh, musical note followed by a long symbol. And this we all know as Fibonacci numbers came out in around 1200 AD, but this has been discussed in details in the systematic study of musical notes in Pingala. Then later on in Bharatam Muni's Natya Shastra in around 100 BC, then Virahanka, Hemachandra all before Fibonacci. 
So, this sort of a recursion which will form one of the examples that we shall do today is actually originated at least we know it is originated in India. Maybe history will tell us whether there was somebody before Pingala who also discovered this form of combinations. Just as a side this whole of Pascal's triangle, binomial theorem, even the concept of 0 is sometimes attributed to Pingala, who again used this light lagu and heavy guru to indicate short and long symbols and encoded systems in that way. Therefore, his notion was also an encoding which is very interesting. And he used the term shunya in Sanskrit to represent this concept of 0, uh, which is also unique. Now, this sort of encoding is very interesting, because the other very compact and very lucid encoding came from Panini in the encoding of the Sanskrit grammar. And legend says that Pingala apparently could have been the younger brother of Panini. Anyway, Coming to our work at hand, we are going to discuss the recursion formed out of these Fibonacci numbers or the Matra Meru of Pingala. So, the definition as we said of these numbers, the recursive definition is f n is equal to 0 if n is less than is equal to 0 or we could also write less than equal to 0 is equal to 1 if n is equal to 1 and is equal to f n minus 1 plus f n minus 2 if n, if n is greater than 1. And this has been of great interest to people. We also know that practically Fibonacci numbers forms a very interesting sequence found in nature. And there is also a closed form solution to this, which is built based on these golden ratios. So, this is how it was defined and this is a very interesting number from number theory point of view also it is a, a very very uh, interesting formalism. Now, how do we write down this down in algorithmic form? In algorithmic form it is written down exactly and in an extremely straightforward manner. We write it down as fib n We say if n is less than or equal to 0, we return 0. Otherwise, if n is equal to 1, we return 1. Otherwise, we calculate based on the formula we calculate and we return m. And we know that if we do it this way, the sequence of numbers for the Fibonacci series that we get turns out to be 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8 and so on. And if we want to just check what is the number of computations that we will get out of this, we can calculate the number of computations or the time complexity. The time complexity of the Fibonacci sequence turns out to be T n is equal to 0 
if n is less than equal to 1, that means there is nothing to compute for the base conditions, but if it is not the base conditions, then it is T n minus 1 because the number of computations for n fib n minus 1 plus T n minus 2, the number of computations for that plus this addition operator which is our plus 1. And if you calculate it out carefully, you will see that this turns out to be the value f n plus 1 minus 1. So, the number of additions, if you work this out in a brute force manner, turns out to be almost the same size and order of complexity as the Fibonacci numbers. And we know that the Fibonacci numbers grow exponentially based on this formula, we know that the Fibonacci numbers grow exponentially. So, what is the issue here? We just follow, because though it is a very straightforward and simple problem, we will do this problem just to follow the process. And our process says that we now need to analyze the recursion structure. So, let us open it up for a particular case. So, suppose it is for 5, then it is solved for 4 and for 3, then for 4 again you solve 3 and 2, for 3 you solve 2 and 1, and for 2 again you solve 1 and 0, for 2 here again you solve 1 and 0, and for 3 you solve 2 and 1, and for this 2 again you solve 1 and 0. And we know that the time complexity that we just got T n based on the recurrence we just saw in the previous slide, T n actually turns out to be Fibonacci n plus 1 minus 1, which is in fact a very large number. And this occurs primarily because we have a number of identical sub problems. That means, we have identical sub problems to be solved. And these identical sub problems are solved again and again and again. And in order to reduce this, we would typically like to ensure that we calculate the values of each items only once. So, we would like to compute the value of f n only once for every n and reuse the same. That means, we would like to follow the principle like this, where we have for 5, we solve 4 and 3, for 4, we will solve 3 and 2, for 3 we will solve 2 and 1 and this we will solve 1 and 0. And whatever we compute once, we would like to remember it and because we want to remember it, this is our concept of uh, the data structure or the data storage that we need 
to store the required past computations. This in our algorithm parlance is called memoization. And if we use memoization, we can easily see that if we compute everything only once, we will get T n equal to order of n. This is a drastic reduction from an exponential complexity by a simple memorization or memoization or storage of those variables. It is not a difficult thing to do, but the most important thing here in terms of the process is that when we open up the recursion, we take care and look at what are called identical subproblems. It is this identical subproblems which in that recursion tree which whose values will be stored and remembered and reused is at the heart of one of the techniques of algorithm design called dynamic programming. So, now we come to the memoization process here. And in order to do that memoization process, the first thing is how do we do the memoization process? We keep an array say fib and we initialize fib 0 to 0 and fib 1 to 1 and the next thing that we do is if we go back and see the past computation here, we could compute it from top down or we could compute it from bottom up. If we try to do a top down algorithm, then for this top down algorithm, the typical process is to maintain an array called done, which says that this value is already done once before. So, this is how you remember that it has been done. You initialize done 0 to 1 and done 1 to 1, all others are 0. And we rewrite this FIB program to check what we do. So, how do we rewrite the program now? How do we rewrite the algorithm? We rewrite the algorithm FIB 2 n as we first check if done n is equal to 1 we return done n. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That is not what we do. What we do is we know that if n is done, then the fifth value is calculated. So, we return fib n. Otherwise, if this is not true, if this is not true, if this is not true, then we calculate m equal to fib 2 n minus 1 plus fib 2 n minus 2. Now that we have got this value, what we have to do is now we have to say done n and assign it 1, because done n, if it has come to this point, then prior to this done n was not 1. So, now we assign done n equal to 1, we assign fib n 
equal to m and we return m. By this what we have ensured is that we have calculated the value of fib array in fib only once because if it is called again and again it will always just call it once. And so, if we want to work it out on our example, if we call it on 5, we know that done 0 is equal to 1, done 1 is equal to 1, all other duns are 0. We also know that fib 0 is equal to 0 and fib 1 is equal to 1. So, if we maintain an array of done and fib, let us say we are maintaining an array where the array index is given, done and fib are given. So, if the array index is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and this is done and this is fib, then these are initialized to 1 and this is initialized to 0 1. Now, 5 will call 4. Now, 4 is not yet done. So, 4 will call 3. 5 will call 4 and 3. This 4 because it goes let us say it goes in this left to right depth first manner. 4 will call 3 and 2 this 3 again it is not done. So, 3 will call 2 and 1. Now, 2 again not done will call 1 and 0. Now, 1 and 0 are done. So, since 1 and 0 are done this this will back up and 1 is done. So, this will back up and f fib 1 will also return 1, fib 0 will return 0. When it comes back here out of this we now have m equal to 1 and now we will set the done value of 2 to 1 and we will set the fib of 2 to 1. Now, when we come back from here, this will return 1. This will come to 1, the recursion will come to the right hand side of 3, it will solve 1, it will return 1. Once these two are returned, dumb 3 will become 1. Once dumb 3 is becomes 1, then this value becomes 2. As soon as this value becomes 2, now here we come back here and this value returns 2. Now, when it comes to 2 here, you notice that done 2 is 1. So, since done 2 is 1, all we need to do is return the value, we do not call it anymore again. So, this is 1 and this value so, immediately 4 is done and the value of 4 is returned as 3, it comes back. So, this value 3 is returned and as soon as this value 3 is returned, again it comes 5 now after having done 4 calls a fib 3, but fib 3 done is 1. So, it does not go into the recursion, it just recalls the value of 2 from here. Now, 5 is done is 1 and this value becomes 5. So, this value becomes 5 and since this value becomes 5, we notice that the number of computations T n is only every done value is calculated only once. Otherwise, so you can easily see from our order notation that this computation is done once, but 
there is a space requirement, which means that we will require an additional ordered n space to solve this problem. But if we look at this very carefully, then we will notice that this additional space is may not be necessary. The second thing is that we could confirm and do this from below. Instead of doing a top down algorithm, we could also do a bottom up algorithm. That means, we could evaluate from the bottom. By evaluating from the bottom, we will start from the bottom and evaluate everything from the bottom. Now, let us see how we will do the bottom up evaluation. So, the bottom up evaluation will be an iteration which does not need to call the recursion and will solve it from the bottom. So, how will we get a bottom up evaluation algorithm? It will be let us say fib 3 n other than the initializations, which we already know that fib 0 is 0 and fib 1 is 1. This is done prior to calling of this fib 3 algorithm. This algorithm will simply do for i equal to 2 to n do, it will do fib i is equal to fib i minus 1 plus fib i minus 2. That is all it needs to do. So, it will it will first compute it, it, it already has the values of fib. So, here are the values 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so forth. And we know that we have already computed these values. The values that we have computed are, these are my predefined notions and by simple iteration of this, this will, sorry, this is 0, this is 1. So, we, so this is 1. So, this becomes 1, this adds these 2 becomes 2, this adds these 2 becomes 3, this adds these 2 becomes 5 and so on and so forth. This is a simple iteration which is a bottom up evaluation. So, this now gives us a bottom up evaluation. We could also see that storing this whole array may not be necessary, because all we require to calculate fib i is its previous two values. So, if we know that fib 0 and fib 1, that means, we could create a fib 4 algorithm by simply using no other array, but using some initial values. So, we will store x 1 equal to 0, x 2 equal to 1, which is the initial values and then from for i equal to 2 to n do, all we will do is we will find out m is equal to x 1 plus x 2 which is this this was fib 0 and this was fib 1. All it will do is compute this and then update x 2 and x 1. Next what it will do is that it will update the value of x 2 as whatever is x 1 and x 1 will be whatever is m 
for the next iteration and we will return at the end of all this whenever we finish everything we will return m as our answer. So, here we see that while in the one in the left we required an array because there is only a dependency of length 2 here as you see in this example on the right everybody has a dependency of length 2 therefore, all we need to do is have only two variables and based on these two variables we could compute our required value. As you see this is a trivial example and we have done it in various ways. We could also do it using recursion using what is called tail recursion and I leave it to you to figure out how we can pass three parameters in FIB instead of passing only n if we pass n and we pass the previous two values then even in a recursive formulation we can get the whole algorithm by propagating the values and I leave it to you as an exercise. We have done a very trivial problem, but the methods that we have followed are important. We have analyzed the complexity by a recurrence relation and we have found by opening up the recurrence relation that there are identical sub problems. The first step we did in identifying that there are identical sub problems after identifying that there are identical sub problems we developed a generic top down algorithm where we remembered what we have done before. But in this particular structure we know that but this remembering seems to be an overkill here, but why we have done it is because it is a generic method and this concept of a generic method of remembering in a separate array that you have done this before will come again and again whenever we face identical sub problems in algorithm design. Then we saw that for this particular case you can actually convert it to an iteration because you can do it from the basis bottom and all you need to do is store everything into an array and then remember it and just use the past computation to do the next computation and the recursion converts to an iteration. We then saw that the amount of memory that we require to remember our past in this particular case is only 2. Finally, there is a tail recursion concept. But as I just pointed out there could be several variations. Let us look at some variations. Let us look at the first variation. Suppose I give you a function f n is equal to f n minus 1 plus f n minus 157. Suppose this is my definition. Then my first question is how will you evaluate it? How many memory locations will be required? How would you do the iteration? And all these issues. The second is now let us assume that in each of these cases the base condition is f0 is equal to 0 and f1 is equal to 1. The other let us assume fn is equal to f n minus 1 plus f n minus n by 2. This yields a slightly different form of recurrence, but this also may not be very difficult and it is worthwhile analyzing this one. This is a third variation where we say f n is equal to f n plus 1 plus f n plus 3 if n is even and is equal to 
f of n minus 1 by 2 if n is odd. Now, here is an interesting thing in the past two cases the value of f n was dependent on past values. Here we have done it in a peculiar way when it is depending also on the future values. And in most general case we can have f n is equal to f of some function g n plus f of some other function h n and the g n and h n could be dynamic, it could be generated based on the value of n and it could be greater than n, it could be less than n. The difficulty that arises here is the possible which does not arise in the other ones is the possibility of cyclic dependencies. So, I request you to have a look at all these four examples and then try to revisit the steps that we had done before and formulate for each of these variational cases, how would we develop the algorithm, what would be our final algorithm and if we have to detect cyclic dependencies for which obviously there is no solution because there is a cycle. If n depends on some n dash and n dash depends on n back again, then obviously f n cannot be calculated. But if that is not known and that is part of the detection of the algorithm, then what would that algorithm be? I leave it to you to think about all these things and we shall discuss these four examples in the class and we shall find out what are the ways in which the solutions develop. With this, we have come to another example which we saw and in this example, we identified another core issue. In the previous examples which we saw in our lectures 1 and 2, our main part was related to balancing the split. So, we set up a recursive definition, we proved, we analyzed, we op opened it up, we examined the structures. In the first two lectures, we looked at balancing the split and choosing the path. Today, we saw about identical sub problems. We also saw today again remembering past computation for future use and we saw how to optimize the required space depending on how many variables you require to store the past computation in terms of memoization. The traversal of the recursion tree as identified in 5 we will not do here though that could also be done in a, in a different manner here. And therefore, with this we have seen that we have discussed two or three core aspects up to now. We will discuss the other core aspects in the subsequent class. Thank you very much. Please feel free to ask.